Today, we are looking at uh, the case Karma Guernica, which will, of course, be in conversation with Brenda Schramerman. Uh, Dawn will be introducing this to us. And with that being said, I'd like to introduce her. Dawn is our moderator for today, and we're really looking forward to today's session. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to say a very, very warm welcome on this Women's Day, which is a celebration of all the magnificent achievements um, that we as women actually do and contribute towards society. I'd like to be able to say it's a celebration. I'd like to say today um, we're going to be focusing on the magnificent work behind me, which is the case Gama Guernica. Um, obviously, it's part of the current 101 exhibition at the Javits Center. To be able to discuss the 101 in conversation, I'd like to hand it over and introduce you to Shanaz Mohammed. Sha Shanaz Mohammed, we are very privileged to say, is one of the curators that sits with Javik. She's also producing artist in her own right. She's a visual producing artist of an exceptional high quality. She's been in numerous competitions and she comes with the credibility of, of being able to introduce. Um, Shanaz, I'd like to hand it over to you just to introduce the 101 um, Keskama Gurnika and where we are with the current um, exhibition at the Javits Center. Thank you very much, Dawn. Um, I also want to firstly wish all of you a happy Women's Day. Um, I feel very honored to be part of this and to have you guys in company for the next hour. So the one-on-one -on -one collecting conversations, um, signature works of a century, uh, was an exhibition that was almost a year in the making before we actually opened up the Javid Art Center. And the thinking behind this was to try and showcase uh, collections or the best of what collections across South Africa had to offer all in one space. So it was a, quite a big task for us. And um, we had an art committee that consisted of uh, myself, um, Kudwano Mukojwa, uh, our director, Christopher Till, uh, Professor Carl Nell, and Bongi Dlomo. So we had the task of having to contact all of whoever was interested in participating and collaborating with us um, across the country or nationwide. And we had asked them to send us um, 10 of their most significant works in their collections. And um, we had received well over um, 300 plus works, which we then as an art committee had to curate and cut down into 101. Um, the 101 also comes from the idea of um, something being introductory or um, learning about it, you know, for the first time when you have like a degree or a, a module in university, it's like 101 English, 101 um, psychology. So we thought this is going to be, we wanted it to be the 101 on art and introduce the public to these important works that will set the basis of, of what they need to know about South African art and history and um, all of that. So this was just um, our behind the scenes process. We um, grouped all of the works according to artists, according to medium. Um, and then we obviously had a criteria and a, of categories that we would uh, select works for. Um, and this was basically our criteria. So what was very important for us, or um, if I can say why we selected the Case Karma uh, Guernica to be part of this exhibition. So we had received this work from the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Art Museum. And I was in contact with Emma O'Brien, who is the assistant director um, at the museum. And she had sent through, you know, their list and their selection from the collection. And the Case Karma Guernica was part of, of that selection. So this was one of the few works, I can say maybe, you know, five of the 101 works that we have on our exhibition that fit into all of the categories that I have listed here. Mm. So works which symbolize the artistic movement from which they arise in, uh, w works that, which tell us something about the times in which they were created. So for us, that first category was uh, the Guernica telling us about um, or, or introducing the, um, the devastation wrought by HIV and AIDS in the early 2000s when it was at its mm -hmm. peak and also pays tribute to those who lost their lives. 
So that fit into that category for us. And then the next one was works which represent uh, a stylistic imperative demonstrating a unique art style, um, excellent master technical skill of the medium. So this was obviously the tapestry and embroidery, uh, but also including other elements. Um, the scale was also very impressive and the talent on, on the work is so clear. Uh, what we also liked about it, or um, in my opinion, what was really nice about having the, the medium of, of tapestry and um, embroidery was that it, the fabric and the materials itself has its own message as a medium. It's something that, you know, is used for safety and protection, covering your shame. You know, it's like when you're fragile or vulnerable, you put on your clothes and you, you're covered and you're protected. So having something that has this kind of underlying meaning with such a powerful message was so important for us. It was, it was really striking in that way, the, the medium that was used to portray the message of, of the work. And then our third category, which was uh, works which have a resonance message uh, and or subject matter that made a significant contribution to research, knowledge, and society's perspective and impact impact on public opinion. Um, and this for us was the idea of the Guernica. And I mean, it, we know that it's an interpretation of Picasso's African Guernica, which you know depicts the horrors of Spanish civil war. So this is something that's been written about and researched. And I mean, it, it's, it's such a, a popular and, and famous topic. And um, that was the, you know, for us uh, also a, an important point with this work. And then lastly, um, work with an enigmatic story, interesting backstory of the work, um, artist background, history, or the artist journey. And that's of course the Nice Karma Art Project um, as a collaborative community owned initiative that enables women. So that for us was so important. And that's how um, this specific work was selected to be part of this exhibition um, because it really, you know, hit the nail on the head with all of these categories. And we thought it's, it's so important for us to have this work and to have it on show. And we feel really lucky and to have, you know, been able to get it on show and introduce it to a new audience that um, who might not have been able to see it otherwise. Um, and so I also just want to thank the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan Art Museum for their assistance and uh, for willing to loan us their work for, for this time and for this exhibition. So thank you. Thank you very much, Shanaz. I really appreciate you joining us today. Um, and I'd just like to say from my viewpoint, I think it's wonderful that we're looking at a piece which is literally the same size as Pablo Picasso's original one. However, it hit all of the targets in regards to the questions that were asked by Javit to say that it was a work of seminal importance. Um, I am very, very um, privileged today and very honored to say we've got joining us as the, our guest and as a subject specialist, not, on the Kes, not only on the Keskama Guernica, but the actual Keskama um, project. And I'd like to introduce her to Professor Brenda Schmarman. She's joining us remotely. Um, Professor is the South African Research Chair in the South African Art and Visual Culture at the Faculty of Art, Design and um, Architecture, FADA, um, and that's at the University of Johannesburg. She's not only a published author of several of these works relating to the subject matter, but she also discusses the critical role that women actually in the community play. And she's going to give us an overview and unpack the importance of the Kiskama Guernica. Prof, I'd like to hand over to you. So much, Dawn. Lovely to be here. Happy Women's Day to everybody. I'm going to run through the history of the, the piece with you. The Kiskaba Art Project was founded by Carol Halfmeyer. Um, she'd moved to the Eastern Cape in 2000. She's got a master's degree in fine arts from UJ, but she also had a medical degree from Wits. If you look at the map, you can see that Hamburg is quite close to East London. It's um, about 80 kilometers away. Um, its name, if you're wondering about it, is because it was founded by German soldiers um, in 1857. So that's why it's got a German name. 
It's a very small village and consists of some sort of holiday homes and my, my middle class people who visit occasionally. But most residents are people who've got very little income. They're people who rely on things like social grants to um, make a living. So poverty is a huge issue in a place like this. Um, the project, the Kiss Calm Art project, has obviously provided people with really much needed income. Hofmeyer hadn't practiced medicine for some time when she arrived in Hamburg, but she found that there were no medical doctors in the area. And this was presenting a huge problem to people. So she resumed practicing medicine alongside art when she got there. Particularly problematic were the rising numbers of HIV AIDS infections. Um, at the time she arrived, there was also resistance on the part of Mbeki's government really to acknowledge that AIDS was caused by HIV. You remember from the early 2000s, that kind of issue. There was a refusal on the part of government to make government-sponsored antiretrovirals available. So South Africa was really an, an escalating AIDS crisis in the early 2000s. HIV rollouts on the part of government were only approved in December 2003, and they became available in some places much later. Hofmeyer began sourcing medication privately in 2004. Um, so she began to put a couple of people on HIV retroviral treatment. And um, in early 2005, the Kiscon Trust that she'd set up became part of an antiretroviral rollout initiative sponsored by the USA government. A house at the center of Hamburg, which is what you can see in front of you, the Umtawalenga Center, was set up in the middle of the town. And it was used for disseminating antiretrovirals, as well as for, as a home for AIDS sufferers, a kind of hospice um, for people who were in a bad way, a kind of recovery center, in fact, more than a hospice. So it was a place for people who were recuperating. In 2005, the project produced the amazing Kiskoma altarpiece, shown at the National Arts Festival midway through 2005, made in the first half of the year. Um, and it's a work that expressed confidence in the community about overcoming the impact of HIV AIDS People had really started to see pe people in the community get better and recover. And it was a sense within this amazing altarpiece that they would overcome its impact. The Kiskama Art Project is really well known for taking renowned works of art and adapting them into pieces with local relevance. So in the case of the Kiskama altarpiece, the source was the Isenheim altarpiece, featuring paintings by Grunewald and sculptures by Nicholas Hockenauer. It's a famous piece in Colma um, in France, which Hoffner had in fact seen. Um, the Isenheim altarpiece was commissioned by monks from the Order of St. Anthony, they were, it was used to care, um, they were involved in caring for the victims of a condition called ergotism, the sort of leprosy condition, um, fatal at the time, and they were providing really comfort. And there's a parallel being drawn here between HIV AIDS and its impact and comfort being offered to the Hamburg community. So the, this idea of parodying a well-known artwork is a strategy that the Kiskom Art Project often use. 
the Kiss Comic Guernica, which was made five years after the uh, Kiss Com altarpiece, was made in a situation where it was around HIV AIDS that trans that had changed dramatically. So there was um, there was no longer the optimism that was in the case of the altarpiece. In 2007, the Kiss Comic Trust ended its relationship with the USA organization that had been funding it to disseminate antiretrovirals. For a couple of years, it was allowed to initiate treatment and care for patients, as it had been doing. But in 2009, regulations meant that it was obliged to discontinue this. Government antiretrovirals had reached the area, but in fact, the way the health system was organized meant that this started to have a, actually a negative effect. Patients were obliged to go to either non Pumalela Hospital in Peri, that was 40,000 kilometers away, which is Cecilia Makawani Hospital, just outside East London, to receive treatment. Um, so huge distances, incredibly inconvenient, and you can imagine expensive for people in a very impoverished community. But even more problematically, the treatment that people started to receive was really very bad indeed. There was neglect, there was ignorance, and there were many instances of absolutely needless death. And these circumstances shaped the content of the Kiskama Guernica. It's got a tone and it's got a mood that's very different from the Kiskama altarpiece. This is not a work made in a spirit of optimism. It's a very dark work. Thank you very much, Prof. If I may interject, I see this is the perfect um, opportunity for me to ask. There's a lot of similarities between the Keskama Guernica and the Pablo Picasso one, which obviously unpacked the atrocities of the war. Can you give us a little bit of a, of a more insight in regards to the similarities of the works? Well, the work, of course, also uses um, parody, as you can see, and as you said, it's of the Guernica, sort of in the well-known work in the Rhino Sophia Museum in Madrid. Um, the bombing of the small town of Guernica was during the Spanish Civil War in 1937, and this was enacted by German forces working in cooperation with the fascist leader Francisco. Um, Franco. It was the very first bombing of a German, I mean, the very first bombing of a civilian population. And um, there were really these innocent people going about their everyday activities when these bombs rained down, completely destroyed the town. And so an analogy is being drawn with the devastating impact of HIV AIDS on the Hamburg community and it surrounds. Um, it's on one level of an analogy being drawn about the sudden blast with terrible effects. You know, in the same way the bombs rained down, HIV, AIDS had that impact on Hamburg. But there's a second level as well. Um, in, in the Guernica, what is being represented is an incident in which people were total victim of decisions by politicians and leaders over which they had absolutely no agency. And that meaning is being transferred as well to the Kiskama Guernica. People as a victim to something completely outside their experience and which they've got no capacity to control. So those are the two kinds of meanings that are being invoked. Um, quite interestingly, how the um, work was made, there was a workshop which involved discussing Picasso's Guernica. 
And um, there was a sorcerer. So people were exposed to, who were involved in the project, the artists, um, whether they were drawing or embroidering, all ex exposed to understanding something about the Guernica. But there was also a drawing workshop held in which people were give us to make sort of counterparts of Picasso's images of weeping women. And some of those drawings, and you can see a couple at the bottom right of the screen. I thought it might be quite helpful to go through the various motifs. One of the sort of dramatic motifs you can see on the Picasso is of this um, sort of woman falling um, out of a burning building. And it's been translated into an image of what, as explained to me, has been an image of Carol Hoffmeyer with her hands up, sort of floundering, um, overcome with these, really a situation in which people were dying and deceased. So it's shown in a sort of dramatic effect. In the Picasso, there are allusions to the crucifixion. It's one of the underlying references within the Guernica. And that idea of a crucified martyr is picked up a little bit in the image of Hofner. And Hofner is again alluded to in the image of the woman, woman leaning out of a burning building, holding a light or leaning out of a building, kind of looking at what's going on around her with a lamp. Carol's being suggested, Carol Hoffmeyer, but she's called on at all hours of the night to deal with dramatic medical emergencies. So that's how it was reinterpreted, once again, an allusion to Hoffmeyer. There's a Pieta like figure in the Picasso as well. It's another key motif. Um, a woman with a dead baby on her lap. And it's adapted in the His Karma Guernica to show a victim. In this instance, it's a woman holding an adult child, the adult child being deceased from AIDS. And a suggestion that those suffering, the majority of those dying from HIV AIDS infections in um, Hamburg and its surrounds by adult people young adults rather than babies. Picasso also uses the iconography of the bullfight along with the crucifixion and the allusions to that throughout the Guernica. There's also at the center of the Guernica, there's quite a key motif. It refers to a horrendous practice to us looking at it, um, of selling off old workhorses cheaply to be sort of sent into the bullfighting ring, to be kind of gored by this angry bull. Um, the horse is therefore um, associated with being a victim. The motif has been changed to a bull in the Kiskama Guernica. You can see it's cattle, it's a bull at the center. It refers to the use, got sort of a few associations, but. I think cattle in ceremonies to mourn the dead. Uh, the cry of the slaughtered bull is evidently very important in ceremonies. It indicates that the ancestral spirits have been summoned. So it's a kind of cry of the horse is translated into the cry of the bull. Um, so it's also a martyr in this instance. There's a detail that's quite interesting. There's text overlaying the skin of the um, bull in the Kiskama Guernica. And it actually refers to desperate text messages that Carol Hoffmeyer was receiving when the brother of a health worker in the Kiskama Trust was busy dying from HIV AIDS. And she that the health worker was desperately trying to get help and this health wasn't, help wasn't forthcoming. So it's the sequence of text messages that have been transcribed here um, over the skin of the bull.
Um, the bull is once again placed on the left of the images, image and in the Picasso it's once again got the connotations of the bull fight. And then the Kiskomagonic it's once again to associate the representation with ceremonies, ceremonies for the dead and for the importance of cattle in these Kosa speaking communities. Another interesting motif taken over is the sort of strange sun-like um, sort of flashing eye sun with electric bulb in the middle that you can see is taken over directly in the Kiskamagonica. In the case of the Kiskamagonica, interestingly, it was made from old overalls of somebody on the project. Um, it was approached to donate these overalls and gave them the fact that they were old and stressed was important. Um, a detail that you can also see in the Gizgama Gurnik as a whole is old blankets are used. There were blankets taken from the um, treatment center when it could no longer function as a treatment center for local people. And so metaphorically, these old blankets the old overalls, they seem to invoke something that's sort of stressed and worn. It's an aging health infrastructure, as well as referring to sort of stress and worn out feeling within the community itself as a result of the um, incapacity to really negotiate and manage the AIDS, and AIDS infections. And then a motif that's been quite sort of strongly adapted, I think, is this one. Um, if you look at the foreground of the Guernica, the Picasso work, you can see that there's a sort of reclining figure, dead figure. His arm is amputated. Maybe it could be a reference to the picket or in the bullring. Maybe a reference to the soldier who lanced Christ's side, if one looks at it in terms of the references to the crucifixion. In the Kiskama Guernica, it's been changed to a motif that has metal plates extended in a line, lots of little metal plates inscribed with the names of people lost to AIDS, along with some beadwork AIDS ribbons. The inspiration for the metal, little metal squares was a photograph of a graveyard in Motherwell in the Eastern Cape. Um, Hoffner had been driving past it. She took photographs before the official gravestones are put on. When the graves are just dug, there's sort of metal plates put on them and they were shining in this, I think it was dawn the dawn light um, and this, this impression of these shining graves, which was very beautiful on one hand, but the sheer number of them gave a strong indication of the number of AIDS victims um, in the Eastern Cape community. And that was used as an inspiration for this row within the Kiskama Gurnica at the bottom. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. I, I know that you um, have been very involved with pulling together the images and you've worked with other ladies um, from the Chetska Magonica and when you worked with very recently Yaniki and um, the team from the Mapula Embroideries. It's not the only projects that have dealt with HIV but there's a lovely association between the two and I'd like to ask you to tell us more about the Mapula group please Prof. Yes you're right. Uh, the Mapula Embroidery project as it was called, it's now called Mapula Embroideries, is an amazing initiative very close to us, set up in the area called the, the Winterfeld. Um, it's just 40 kilometers northwest of Pretoria, um, an area that's very urban. 
if you look at the screen, the images I put up in front of you, you can get a sense of its very urban identity. If you look at the top middle image and the top bottom image, um, sort of sense of it, urban parts, um, rural parts, to, um, both within the area. Um, when the um, Mapula project was started in 1991, the Winterveld was part of the homeland of Botswana. Um, it's very, very impoverished, had very poor infrastructure then, improved today, but still pretty bad. But really at the time, it was drastic. Um, people didn't have access to, ready access to water or electricity. Most of the population in, were not in fact Swana speakers, although it was ostensibly part of the so-called homeland of the Botswana at the time. There were most of the population or many of the population in the Winterfeld were people who'd been displaced, often through forced removals. It was, it was a situation of really desperation and poverty. The project was started in 1991 by Sir Optimists International, who were working with the Sisters of Mercy. Um, the Sisters of Mercy had established an adult education center in the Winterfeld. The late Corin Scavron, who was formerly head of history of art and fine art at UNISA, um, she was a Soroptimist and she basically came up with the idea of a, an art project and a project involving embroidery. And she drew in, drew in others from UNISA, notably Aniki van der Merve is here with us this, this morning, which is fabulous. Um, and she became the person who took responsibility for marketing the works that the project were producing. Members of the project usually make their works individually. So the big large scale works about this Karma Art Project, which we've looked at, are group, group works. Whereas most of the works by the Mapula Project are made by some, maybe somebody will do the drawing and normally one person, occasionally two, will do embroidery. Um, or sometimes people will draw and embroider their own works. But they're not big group works, they're made mostly sort of individually or with two people, or mostly three, what most three. Um, initially, everybody used to meet at the education center to make their works and see a view of the inside of people embroidering in the um, adult education center on the top left of this general image I've put up. The Mapula Embroidery Trust's board consists of seven trustees who represent different stakeholders and contribute their expertise to fulfill its main objectives, which you've mentioned, Brenda, its support for the community of Mapula Embroiderers in what they do, and it's empower the women of the Winterfeld and secure its sustainability. Below the trust, there's a Mapula Embroideries Production Board that's in the Winterfeld. The community of embroiderers are living in different areas, as you've mentioned, and uh, to manage the production, three groups were formed with each with a group coordinator, which you've mentioned, who takes care of organizing production in this group but they also deal with possible social issues. Um, the coordinators together with four chosen members from the broader embroidery community make up the Mapula Production Board. A lot of people always uh, want to know why the project has not yet totally in the hands of the Mapula women. Um, for the past 10, almost 10 years, we've worked towards uh, the project being community driven by the Mapula Pula women. This has not been achieved. It's quite difficult. The factors which have stood in the way um, are financial. Um, we have not had the funds and the time because for the first 25 years, um, I was managing the project with the marketing and I was busy 
full-time employed by UNISA and then by Pretoria University. So um, only since 2016, we've got the working trust where Sally and Josie and everybody's involved um, assisting towards training and towards uh, that. Educational, we have different levels of education, so it can it varies and it's in some cases no. So maybe the next generation um, exposure, poverty has not allowed the women to experience a much wider world. Um, language, the majority of the women communicate in their mother tongue with little fluency in English, which is needed for PR, marketing and sales. Geographic, the Mapula Sochangube is far, far offish from the cities and public transport is expensive. So we've tried to achieve and hope to have succeeded a relationship of trust between the volunteers and the women, the sense of partnership with the women, <coughs> and the inclusion of some of the women in management and decision-making structures onto the board and onto the trust. We've also done some upskilling, training in bookkeeping and computer literacy. So for the future, we are in the middle of a process with input from a team set by Professor Nick Benadell from the Gibbs Business School to help the trust move Makula forward for a long-term future. And that's how we sort of started working closely now with Carol Hofmeyer and Michaela House. So that's been a very nice beginning of a very nice collaboration. Thank you very, very much, Janiki. I really, really appreciate it. And I think what's wonderful that you've mentioned there is the direction the ladies have taken. And I really appreciate that um, you've managed to dial in. And I'm going to say up front that we, we um, have asked and we're really appreciative that the ladies of the community, which are actually the, um, the, the, the artists, the ladies that have done all this work, we've asked them to actually assist um, pre-lockdown, we were going to have actually had the session here with the ladies participating mm. and Prof Brenda, and we were very excited about it. However, with the current circumstances um, and no electricity and no transport and no power and everything that goes with it, we've looked after everyone's health and we've asked for remote dialings and pre-recorded messages. We are going to try and play you some pre-recorded messages of what the ladies have discussed in the community of the similarities and the work that they produce with the HIV and the AIDS epidemic. But we've just alluded to something that Yannicki's mentioned, which is the association of what they're doing with the Keskama ladies and what they're doing now currently with the COVID um, lockdown and the situation with the pandemic we're having. And I know Professor's got some really exciting news to tell us about the current project that Prof. Prof. Brenda and um, the, the at the university around the corner are actually doing. So would you like to tell us a little bit more about that, please, Prof? Oh, yes. No, that's... Um, I, I heard that the um, Napoleon Embroidery Project were working on COVID-19 as a topic. Just got a sense that they were busy. So I thought, you know, I really want to see these works and I wanted to updated research on the project. And I thought about it, why not commission a series on that? So I've worked to commission 14 works from people. It struck me that at this particular time, people would really need money. Um, at this particular moment, there's no tourism, galleries mm -hmm. aren't open. It's very difficult for people who depend on art making to earn a living, so that that would be a good way also to get money instantly into the project and enable people to get income and at the same time to get a series of fabulous works which will become part of the UJ collection and which I hope to exhibit at a happier time when it's not um, something that stops us all being able to go to an actual gallery and possibly put up in the time of a conference. So those are some really wonderful works. I've got a couple of, got images of a couple of them if I go to the PowerPoint. That would be wonderful if you could share. Thank you very much, Prof. Just to look at those, those are just two of the 14. 13 have been completed by now. 
The one on the left is by Selena McQuana. She's an example of a person who does her own drawing and embroidery. And she's one of the most sort of experienced and amazing artists in the project. Um, Emmanuel Maepa, um, the son of Rosina Maepa, drew the one on the right. And you can see by the names at the top, it's been embroidered by Joyce in Beloy. Um, so another example of an interesting um, one. I was very keen that people not um, present an idealized version of COVID-19 or soft, soft talk um, the situation. And I really like this work on the right in the sense that it shows fairly bluntly um, issues of hunger um, and desperation in the context of COVID-19 um, and doesn't sort of say that everything's under control and wonderful. Um, so um, that, that work for me was, I, I liked from that point of view and I love the one on the left which shows the arrival of the Cuban doctors just because of the visual inventiveness of it. Um, the the um, one by Mkwana. So those are just two of the examples. Prof Brenda, I really am appreciative of you including the images. We were very lucky that the ladies, and we've had several of them, um, Pinky and Rebecca and um, Elizabeth have done pre-recorded messages for us, um, um, which it gives not just the everyday reality of, of dealing with it. It is the complexity of the poverty, the having no electricity, the actually having no power, to have no transport, to have no food. And I think we need to actually be aware of it. These are very turbulent times. And if we know what the everyday reality is, there's an element of hope and faith, faith that comes through in their work. And that's what I think you've alluded to. It's some beautiful delicacy of the works, which talks about the faith and the hope with dealing with the everyday reality. And a couple of questions that we've got, and I'm going to just respond. Oh, the relevant questions here. Um, how do the ladies design the work before starting to do the embroidery? And I think Prof Brenda, this is a lovely one for you because that's part of the workshops they've done in terms of imagery and development. If you can answer that one, Prof Brenda. For the Kiskan Art Project, often there's the looking, I think I sort of alluded to a little bit of that with the Guernica. There's looking at the work, a big large work that's being, um, parodied. Um, often there's a broad idea for a work that comes up and often uh, uh, Carol often is the author of that idea. And then people workshop and discuss how to reinterpret it locally. Um, often photographs are sourced that are going to be parallels to the imagery that might come up in the new work. So for example, standing behind you in the Guernica, that image of the women, that was, that was based on photographs taken at a funeral. Um, so the women in the Kiskoma Guernica behind you, um, Dawn. Um, so the photographs might be used as well, sometimes drawing from imagination, but often from um, source images as well. Different people will often draw different parts. So as I, um, the image I showed was uh, a few designers worked on this, this work. Um, there are a few people that um, do the design. I think Sebo and Vubu did the bull, if I remember correctly. Um, and there, there were different people worked on the, the the images and they were put together rather than one person doing the entire design, but often photographs used. And then the works often go to embroiderers. Um, they find often in pieces to different groups of embroiderers um, who work together on the embroidery and then they'll be connected up. I think that's sort of a broad overview. And I hope it's the answer. 
Thank you very much, Prof. Brenda. I appreciate responding. Um, Yaniki, we are just on time. Do you have anything that you'd like to add to that one? Because I see there's a lot of, when I watch the video snippets, which you're all going to see on YouTube afterwards, there's a lot of the everyday reality that's been done in there. So if there's something else you'd like to add for the actual design work. On, on the Mapula class, it works slightly different because there are about five or six people that do the drawings and the designs and the conceptualization of the ideas. And um, it just evolved over the years. The Mayepa family started with Rosina. She taught the others. And then they would do the drawing per class. I'm not talking about the small little things. That we've got a different method to do. You know, the bags and the cushion covers. But the storytelling class, they would, um, the person that does the drawing, I call them all artists because the embroiderer chooses the colors. So the, the first person that does the drawing would draw it with the crayon and then um, hand it over to the embroiderer. The embroiderer will do the outline and then fill it in. Uh, but the artists get their imagery nowadays from internet um, and all kinds of things. So I would just say Brenda has commissioned everything on the COVID see what you can do and it's amazing how Selena Makwana comes up I mean before I knew about the Cuban doctors they were in on the class so that's how they've done they do all their own design we don't um, interfere with the creative process thank you very much Janaki and I'm hoping to see you all in the flesh in this magnificent um at this magnificent structure that we call Javit UP and it's home Again, thank you to everyone, Prof, and ladies, have a wonderful day. Much appreciated. See you soon. Bye. I draw these pictures to let the people know that the person who have HIV AIDS is still the same when she was not getting affecting this disease. We must accept her or him. We must live with her and don't discrim discriminate her or him. We must always know he is the, our, is he our family. Hi, my name is Kelelo Maipa, the designer of Mapula Project. I'm here to tell you about this lot of COVID-19 that I made. I made this lot of COVID-19 because now it is relevant to us and the whole world. I decided to draw this lot to make people understand and know about this COVID-19. As you can see, here are the people at the funeral. There mustn't be more than 50 people here. There's a policeman, a police van here. And these are the soldiers which our minister sent to our communities who do not comply with the rules of the government. And then we have people there who are also coming to the funeral. These are our undertakers who are forced to wear masks and their protective clothes to be protected against the virus. And this, our, this is our doctors. And yeah, this is our ministers, Mr. General Begi Kele and our president Cyril Ramaphosa. Uh, hello, I'm Dora Songwani from Mapula Project. Uh, I've done this drawing of a uh, coronavirus lockdown because of uh, this virus uh, traumatized us a lot. So I've decided and I, I've done a lot of thinking about this before I've done this. You can see here the president is uh, alerting us that we must stay at home, we must be safe, and uh, we got the police, we got the uh, soldiers that may uh, help us to stay at home, not uh, going around to just to be safe. Then here is an airport, uh, our the doctors from uh, Cuba arrived to help us with this coronavirus uh, thing. And here, 
it's when we, we, we heard about this thing, then we started to panic. What are we going to do? Because we are not working now. Everything is, uh, is locked down, is shut down. So I've decided that if we can think about doing our own gardens, uh, maize meal, we can do it because uh, we have learned from our uh, grandmothers and so on. So I decided to put this story here so that somebody must learn from here uh, so that we must not uh, starve with a uh, hunger. Uh, this is my second drawing, this one. So the coronavirus here is spreading. So that's why I've decided to show the people that uh, you must uh, be four meters away from other one. And then these trees uh, shows that we are still alive. We can believe and hope and have faith. And the water is very important that we must have a running water so that we may wash every, every uh, 20 seconds to wash our hands. So if you got something, we have to run to the hospital. So the ambulance is ready for us to help us, to take us to the uh, hospitals, to the clinics. And then we must also know that we must use sanitizer, gloves, mask all the time. And vegetables are good all the time. Hi, I'm Stella Minesi. I'm living here in Winterfeld from Mapula Project. I embrace this because of the coronavirus. So we must wear masks every day. And I, I embrace this part. I see the, the president is, is teaching us about the, the coronavirus. President said we must wear masks every day when we go to the toilet outside anywhere. To, 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 make, to take us safe. This is coronavirus is spreading here. So that's why president say we must wear masks all the time. Hi, I'm Pinky Rasenga. I'm staying in Winterfeld. I'm staying with my daughter and my husband, Mar, but I'm scared for coronavirus because now she didn't work in nothing. The project has got no money anymore. And now, I'm scared for the coronavirus. Married now I've got no food in the house, got no nothing. I am Francina Maikezo. I'm doing embroidery for the COVID-19 and I do the embroidery for that death loss with Elizabeth Malithi. And this is uh, the hospital and this is uh, the president Ramaphosa and this is the people this is sanitizing and this is the spray the hospital and that is the ambulance and this is a graveyard and this is a hospital and this is the people in the graveyard.